started, I'd come into a world which I had no idea existed. I thought this was creation gone mad. It was what the, the gods must have created to make something ultra special. Charlie Varon is widely known as the godfather of coral. Curiosity drives interest, and I've never lost that curiosity at all. And I've never lost that love of being underwater. As soon as I'm in the water, I feel I'm at home. I really do. Charlie is one of the world's best known and most respected reef scientists. He's identified more than a fifth of all the world's coral species. The very, very essential thing about corals is they build their own place to live. Corals have got together with algae to build things that nothing on Earth could possibly rival. That's how they live. And I reckon that's as fascinating as, as biology can get. 30 years ago, he started seeing changes to the climate that made him very worried. Back in the 1990s, you made some pretty dire predictions. What did you say? I predicted that by 2015, the carbon dioxide levels would be so high that it would cause bleaching practically every year. How did it feel to be right? It felt horrible to be right. Scientists long to be right because that's what their, their business is. But it's all happened and the consequences of that have turned out to be much worse than those predictions. It's exactly like me seeing my family slowly dying of something. It's very grave-like. The spectacular colour of healthy corals is complemented by tiny algae that live within them. When the water gets too warm, the corals commit a kind of suicide, expelling the algae, a major source of food. The corals then turn white, exposing their skeleton. If the water stays too hot for too long, the coral starves and bacteria and seaweeds take over. In 1998, the Great Barrier Reef experienced its most destructive bleaching event to date. Half the corals were damaged, mostly in the southern and central regions. It wasn't devastating, most corals survived, but it was a warning. Four years later, it happened again, in much the same regions. But then came 2016, the big bleach. That killed off a third of all shallow water corals. Half the corals north of Port Douglas bleached and died in eight months. The following year, another 20% of those corals bleached and died. It was the first back-to-back -back bleaching event ever recorded. So the interval between pairs of repeated bleaching events globally is shrinking. Professor Terry Hughes is a marine biologist at James Cook University and one of the world's most prolific reef researchers. It takes about 10 years for the fastest growing corals to regrow their population if it's badly affected by a bleaching event or, or a cyclone. The problem with the 10-year window that's required for a decent recovery is that the chances of us having a fifth bleaching event in that time period is, is actually very high because of global warming. The damage is shocking. In the hardest hit areas, vast fields of coral have turned into colourless graveyards. The complex architecture of a thriving reef reduced to rubble. Is it fair to say that those reefs are dead? 
No, I, uh, it's, it's completely inaccurate to describe a reef as being alive or dead. So reefs can be damaged, which means they've lost a significant amount of their corals. But I would never describe a reef as being dead. There are still about a billion corals alive and kicking out on the Great Barrier Reef today, particularly in the southern half of the reef, which escaped the bleaching in, in both of those years. Even in some of the worst affected reefs, there are small, hopeful signs of recovery. Reef systems are both delicate and resilient at the same time. All this looks dead, but if you look closely, you can see the tips of the staghorn corals starting to form shoots. Because the base of the stem is dead, they are still incredibly fragile. The scientists say this is a form of natural selection. Elsewhere, tougher corals survived and are slowly regrowing, but it is changing the physical shape of the reef, losing the complexity that makes it the richest, most diverse ecosystem on the planet. Corals are really the linchpin of the ecosystem. Professor Ove Hergulberg from the University of Queensland is a leading biologist specialising in the reef and climate change. When you go out there and you say, in the ocean, how many species of fish live in and around coral reefs? The answer is about a quarter. You then look at the importance that those fish and those corals have to fisheries that are worth millions of dollars to Australians, uh, to tourism, you know, five to six billion dollars worth of tourist revenue coming into our country because we have this pristine, beautiful structure you very soon realise that corals are really important to Australia. If there is one group as invested in the reef as scientists, it's tour operators. The reef supports about 64,000 jobs across Australia and generates $6.5 billion for the economy each year. It also makes about two million visitors very happy. Yeah, it can be a bit dangerous. We do the sunset sailing and now we're up to 27 spontaneous marriage proposals. So the, the, the nature has got a lot to answer for. Steve Edmondson has been bringing tourists to the reef for more than 15 years. As romantic as his job might be, he is clear-eyed about what is going on beneath the water. Underwater, um, they are more challenges, um, as in there will be some sort of small patches of bleaching, and it, it is something we are worried about. However, the best thing we can do, because it's still a wonderful place to visit, is educate and inspire people. The tourism operators understand the changes that are taking place to the reef almost as much as the scientists. They see it every time they come out here. The dilemma, though, is the extent to which they shout about it to push for the kinds of changes, policy changes, that will help protect the reef without frightening away the tourists. We've heard it said so often that, that the reef is dead. Are you sick of hearing that? The reef is in no way dead, but it's challenged, and that's where we need to be uh, a lot smarter in a, as a global asset, that people take it seriously, that we could do a lot better than we are doing. Worried about scaring tourists away, the Association of Marine Park Tourism Operators had criticised green groups for overstating the impact of climate change. But earlier this year, it changed tack. For the first time, it publicly called on the federal government to take stronger action on climate and help protect the industry. Tourism can have a negative impact on, on small reefs if it's not properly managed, but in Australia I think it is properly managed. And so tourism, I think, is a force for good. It provides the social and economic reason, the $6 billion industry, the 65,000 jobs, why we need to better protect the Barrier Reef. Nobody's coming to Great Barrier for being disappointed, so it's important to put that into perspective. But do you need to be honest about what's been happening? Absolutely, because I can tell you anything, but if you ask to my passengers and guests, who, people who are experiencing it, what, whether that was a worthwhile experience, that's where it comes mm. down to the crunch. 
I expected more vibrant colors, things like that. The fish, uh, yeah, the diversity also of the fish, it was amazing to see that. Some of the coral really looked dead, some of it was gone, it was grey. But there were also pieces of it where there was colour and life, so yeah, it's a bit half-half. Was it worth it? Has it been something that you would recommend? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, it was really Definitely, nice. Yeah. yeah, for me also, yeah. It was really a, a nice experience, yeah. Can you, as an industry, survive if the reef continues to degrade? Um, it will severely be impacted, so will thousands of jobs and the diversity of tourism. The attraction to come to Australia, if we feel that it's just not worth doing or I'm a bit too late, that would have a massive impact. The reef is in serious danger. Even the government's own advisory panels say if the corals are to survive, it must move fast to reduce all the pressures. If you see something you really love dying, of course it has a huge impact. It's very hard to continue when so many people think, oh, there's nothing wrong. And that makes me angry because this is utter stupidity.